So to continue our history of Western civilization and science in particular, uh, we are now up to Lamarck and what comes after Lamarck. So who comes after Lamarck? Darwin, so this is young Darwin here. Darwin lived in the 1800s and he's arguably the second greatest scientist ever, right? Newton wins, Darwin second. So first off, he studied to be a doctor. He realized he was not going to be able to become a doctor when he saw the amputation of a child's limb in the days before anesthetic, and he realized that was not for him. Then his um, family recommended he become a pastor, which he was all set to do, but he always had an interest in nature and kind of looking at things. Actually, when he was at university studying to be a doctor, he actually spent a lot of time at the beach with his favorite professor just looking at seashells instead, which may have also contributed to that failed pre-med experience. So he's interested in nature, and when he was 21, he actually goes on a boat trip and he was actually almost prevented by his father. His father actually thought it would corrupt him and make him unsuitable for marriage within the sort of social class they came from. His grandfather actually wrote a, a letter on his behalf to help him go. So he takes this boat trip. It's a five-year mission on the HMS Beagle, so that's the name of the ship, and their mission is to seek out new life, and actually it's more to map the coastline of the world for the British Navy, so they would know where everything was and have a, be able to have a fighting chance against Spanish and the French and all those. And he was chosen in particular for the Beagle as a psychological babysitter for Captain Fitzroy. This is the captain of the ship, also from kind of the, the upper class. And he wanted somebody else in the upper class in his boat because what happened back then is you couldn't mix the different social classes. So captains often ate by themselves all the time in their boat. And he had had friends who, after several years of eating dinner by themselves all the time, committed suicide from depression. So he wanted someone to have dinner with. And so a guy here from the upper class who could get on his boat for five years and have dinner with, that was perfect, right? So Darwin gets the job. He doesn't really have any duties on this boat other than having dinner with the captain. And other than that, every time when they come ashore, he can do whatever he wants, right? He can study nature, and he doesn't really have any other um, responsibilities. So he has lots of time to study nature during this trip that's going all over the world. So. He did a number of things. He discovered there were fossils that corresponded to current life. So he found fossils that looked similar to things that were currently alive. So that goes back to one of our lines of evidence for evolution. But he also saw that they, didn't, they weren't all the same. Right? There was change in this fossil record and differences between the fossils and the modern organisms. Because the boat was at sea a lot, he had lots of time. So he read Lyell's book. and became a uniformitarian convert, right? He read about uniformitarianism, and it totally made sense to him, right? If you have slow, gradual change over long periods of time, this can end up causing big overall differences. He also read Malthus, who is famous for writing this book about how food production can't keep up with an exponential growth in population, and there'll be lots of bloodshed and violence. Malthus was writing about people when Darwin read Malthus, he realized that the same sort of thing happens in nature, right? Organisms can't keep reproducing and having exponential growth without limit. There will be some sort of struggle to survive. Not everybody gets to live, and there are probably maybe some differences between the ones that live and the ones that don't. And so we kind of got this idea that maybe this change over time in animals was because not everybody lives, and maybe some of the ones that live are different from like the average, and then maybe in the next generation, the average would be a little bit different. And then if that happens, like, you know, it's not much generation per generation, but if it happens over a long period of time, then maybe that explains how, like, these animals are changing. Right? So he's getting these kind of ideas all kind of mixing around in his head. He's still young, right? He's only 21. He's got a boat trip. Um, he's actually seasick a lot of the time. So a lot of the thinking does happen later. So he returns to England. The first thing he does, and this makes him famous, is he develops theory on the origin of atolls and coral reefs. So he actually started off as what we would call a geologist today. Right? So the distinctions between geology, biology, chemistry weren't as developed back then as they are now. And he's the first person who really comes up with an idea for how coral reefs form. And it's the same sort of thing, right? Little corals over a long period of time, generation by generation, build these giant reefs. So that mindset allowed him to explain coral reefs and atolls, which are really interesting types of islands, and gave him this reputation as a, a geologist who had a lot of really good ideas. 
He then married his cousin, Emma Wedgwood, of the Wedgwood China family. So she was rich. So he then really didn't have to work. He didn't have to go and become a pastor and spend a bunch of time um, writing sermons and visiting sick people. He could actually spend the rest of his life um, making 10 kids and thinking about geology. It seems he probably contracted Chagas disease or something similar. He was actually ill for the rest of his life. So he really couldn't get out much. He spent most of his time at home. He was sick. I'm not so sick he couldn't make 10 kids, but wasn't really traveling anymore. He had the five-year trip, and that was about it. Everything after that was via correspondences by letters and by studying samples people sent him. Now, by 1842, he had sketched out his theory of evolution in a book, right? He had like a, an outline, whole survival of the fittest, that sort of thing leading to evolutionary change. By 1842, he had this written up. But he knew it was going to be a really big idea. He knew that this was a, a radical change, a radical idea. And so he really wanted a perfect book, right? He wanted to write a book with a thousand pages that nobody could argue with. So even though he had a draft in 42, he spent a lot of time gathering more and more kind of examples. So actually for eight years, he works on barnacles. There's this anecdote where his, his kid goes over to a friend's house and you know, gets the tour of the house and asks the friend, oh, but where does your dad study his barnacles? Because he, in fact, had an entire shed in the backyard full of barnacles. And of course, his kids thought it was normal. So he spent eight years focusing on barnacles to try to get examples for this perfect book. He's working on the book, working the book, getting more and more information. And then in 1858, he gets a, a letter or paper from a guy called Alfred Wallace. And the paper is called On the Tendency of Varieties to Depart Indefinitely from the Original Type. And he gets this letter because he's a famous geologist and he's known to be friendly and helpful to young scientists. And Wallace has come up with this idea that maybe if you have a group of organisms and they're different from each other and there's different varieties, maybe some live better than others, they have a higher chance of surviving, maybe the next generation looks more like the survivors, and if this was happening in a couple different places, maybe they'd like end up looking different from each other and you would have things changing over time. So basically this letter that Alfred Wallace sent to Darwin, essentially asking for his advice like, oh, Mr. Darwin, you're famous, I've written this paper, what do you think about it? That paper that Wallace had written is exactly this theory of evolution that Darwin has spent the previous 16 years working on. So the natural reaction is to kind of panic, right? Because somebody else, some guy he's never heard of, has come up with the same idea on his own. So who is this Alfred Wallace? So Alfred Wallace was not from the upper class, right? He's not like Darwin. He's actually a middle class sort of guy. He doesn't have family connections, doesn't have a rich relative to marry. He had quite the career. He's actually the first European that really studied wild apes in the wild. And his profession, because he had to have one, was he went around the world and collected biological specimens and then brought them back to England and sold them to rich people. Because one of the things that rich people used to do at the time was have little museums in their manor house, right? So if you watch Downton Abbey, um, something like that a couple hundred years ago totally would have had like a little museum. What he did is he traveled the world, got interesting stuff, brought it back to England and sold it to people, and that's how he raised enough money to plan his next trip. Uh, he was not particularly lucky, so he went to South America, contracted malaria, got on the boat, on the boat back to England. It actually exploded and he lost all of his specimens. So um, for his next trip, he actually went to Asia instead. But while he's doing all this, and kind of you know, a working scientist, in 1855 he writes a scientific paper talking about how new species arise near similar ones, right? So when you look at the fossil record, you see that fossils resemble species that are currently living in that same area. And in 1858, he writes this paper about evolution by natural selection and sends it to Darwin for advice, because Darwin is a well-known person at this time. Now this paper, what it does is it spurs Darwin to finally publish his book, right? So Darwin had been sitting on this idea and developing it for 16 years. This paper spurs the publication of that book, gets Darwin off his rear end and gets him to publish this thing. Later on in his career, Alfred Wallace clearly acknowledged Darwin to have better developed the theory, right? So he wrote a book that he titled Darwinism. And then, because people have all sorts of different interests, he later campaigned for women's rights, which was kind of weird in the uh, 1800s. was one of the first people to talk about the conservation of nature. But he also believed that the bumps on your head um, could tell you about your personality. He believed in psychics. believed in socialism, which is either good or bad, depending on what you think. 
and he was also anti-vaccination, so that goes more with phrenology and less with things we think are correct. So Darwin, in 1859, publishes this book on the origin of species, kind of pushed into it by this letter in 1858 from Wallace. In fact, um, what had happened is at the end of the year in 1858, the Royal Society published Wallace's paper and published the table of contents of Darwin's book so that everybody would know that they had both been working on it. Over the course of the rest of his career, he publishes 17 books, or actually throughout his entire career, 17 books. These are Darwin's books, right? So his first book, 1839, this is travelogue, basically, of the boat trip on the Beagle. Here he's editing a more sciencey version of the stuff he saw on the Beagle. Here's his book about coral reefs, which makes him famous. 1842 is when he has his draft of the origin of species. Here's something about islands. Here's a whole bunch of books about barnacles and yellow. His famous book in 1859, and then because he'd spent so long working on it, he had a bunch of extra information he couldn't fit into this book, so he was able to publish a series of other books in quick succession. So variation in domestication and descent of man. Man is not exempt from evolution. This is essentially animal behavior here and a bunch of other examples. So he actually publishes really a considerable amount. So in addition to 17 books, it's 155 articles, 10,000 pages of science. He's doing a lot of publishing, but again, he's ill, so he's not going and doing debates in person, which is how things used to be done back in the 1800s. But he gathers a large number of people who support him. There are also a large number of people who disagree with him. And they have a series of debates kind of in London and in the US and everything um, in his absence, right? Because he's ill and stays at his um, country home. So what is this Darwin-Wallace theory, or I suppose at this point in the 1800s, it's a hypothesis? Well, there's two things. There's a pattern and a process. The first is the pattern that evolution occurred, right? Things changed over time. And second, common descent, that things today that are really similar to each other, they had the same ancestor, and that's why they're similar to each other. This is two things about the pattern of how life got to be the way it is now. And then it also proposes a process. So first of all, things gradually happen. You don't have catastrophes or saltational events. Populations are the things to think about. The populations are the natural group that is undergoing evolution and changing. And populations are becoming different species, and species are changing over time. Individuals aren't changing. Individuals aren't making babies that are more like themselves, like Lamarck. Rather, it's certain individuals within the population doing better or worse causes the population to be different generation by generation. And natural selection, this kind of idea that there are more individuals alive than can survive, so some do better, some do worse. And nature's selecting individuals naturally is the thing that's causing this population to change. This is the process part. And the big thing that's happening here is a shift from the typological to a variational focus. So Plato and Aristotle and Linnaeus, they looked at organisms as types. And variation was noise that obscured being able to see what the type was. Now there's a shift to there's no more types. And variation, instead of being noise, variation is critical. Variation is important because variation is what allows natural selection to occur, right? The fact that individuals differ from one another allows selection to choose some individuals and they do better. And then in the future, the population is going to look more like them. So this idea, this typological idea, had been around for 2,000 years. And in the 1800s, we get a shift to a variational focus when we think about life. And this is a huge conceptual shift in how we think about life. And this is one of the reasons why Darwin is the second greatest scientist. Right? The first greatest scientist, our shift is we can use science to explain nature. Second greatest science, we shift our way of thinking about life from being typological to being variational.